time for more Tech Talk. But before we get into that, we need to remind people that if they need help with their home voiceover studio, if you want to learn a lot more, you're starting from scratch, mm -hmm. if you are an established pro making billions of dollars because it's been promised to all of you out there that the voiceover world is paved with gold, some of you who happen to be doing that, you still <laughs> need to have your home voiceover studio. It is a must in 2018, 2019, and forward. And there's only two guys who have created, curated, fixed, maintained, and tuned to absolute perfection in the world that know how to do it. That's you and me. Right? That's right, man. <laughs> okay, good. Your, tur your turn to, to do some from hyperbole here. TowardsTheTech.com is where you find me on the web. I, I uh, can be booked for real-time services where we're on the phone or on Zoom or something, or you can send me in files for what I call more of a virtual engineering, self-service kind of thing. And uh, it's I can design your studio. I can tell you why your mic's buzzing. All that stuff right over there at georgethetech.com. And Dan is over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I offer very similar services. I am a full-time voice actor. I am not the big-time engineer that you are. But I've built a whole bunch of these studios. I look at it from the voice actor's perspective. The real world, The folks. real world, yes. And, uh, and so I, I know a bit or two about what it's supposed to sound like. Right. And, uh, or whistle. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you know what that means. And Every time you say that, I want to whistle. <laughs> feel free. It, it can be the, you know, the, the, uh, the bed to this, this particular thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can send me a file at homevoiceoverstudio.com. All you got to do is click on the specimen collection cop at the bottom of the, uh, the homepage. And, uh, I will, for 25 bucks, I will analyze your audio, see if it's right. And occasionally I talk to you about it. That's right. We will occasionally bounce thing off. If one stumps, if one of us gets stumped, we'll bounce it off the other. We had a cool one last week. Uh huh. That was like, what is that? I was close, wasn't I? You were. You were. That was the Wi-Fi thermometer. The, the thermometer. Yes. And I think that was Simon Vance's studio. Yeah. All of a sudden, it went every sixty seconds. Every sixty zzz. seconds, there was this like some Bluetooth thing is trying to find its mate. <laughs> And I was close. Yeah, it was a was Wi-Fi good, thing yeah. sending yeah, it was out a, a signal. Wi-Fi thing, yeah. And Simon figured that out on his own amazingly. Well, he's a smart guy. <laughs> he is. Anyway, we've got a bunch of tech questions for uh, our expertise coming right up here. And we'll start off with Cole Niblet. Hmm. Uh, she says, uh, or he says, I was hoping you could help me understand latency and buffer size a little better. I recently purchased an Audient ID4 and have the option to set the latency and buffer size. Mm -hmm. I started out selecting a variety of different combinations. And to my ears, I couldn't hear much of any difference. I'm running a PC, Windows 7, and Reaper is my DAW. It is the automatic setting, the best option, or how do you find the right settings for my setup? Tons of thanks in advance. Cole. Well, first off, my immediate thought is, who are you listening to? You know, a lot of people, headphones on, headphones off. That has to do with latency, but what's yeah, your that's thoughts the, on that? Yeah, that's the monitoring side. Of it. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny that I can't remember the last time this question came up. And here it is. You know, so I'm, I'm glad we're covering what seems to me new ground here on this particular topic. But uh, the latency and the buffer are related to each other. The larger the buffer, the longer the latency. Well, what's the latency we're talking about anyway? That's the time between the, t the time it takes for your voice to go into the microphone, get recorded into the computer, and then make its way back through the computer, through the interface to your headphones. That's right. the latency. Right. So why do we as voice actors have to worry about latency? Well, we basically don't. We don't need to monitor ourselves. So right. if you really have to monitor yourself, you should not be monitoring what comes out of the doll. You should be monitoring what comes out of the interface. Right. That's why, like the the a mixer, you're hearing the sound right off the mixer. If you're on a um, Scarlett 2i2, there's a direct monitor button. When you press that, it's literally an audio feed that goes from your mic into your headphones. Make sure your speakers are off, and your speakers yeah. have to be off. <laughs> Feedback central. Um, so that latency really only is relevant for musicians who are doing overdubbing and doing multi-track recording. Right. 
So they actually are really concerned about latency. They want to make sure that when they punch in a recording or they play over top something else, that the two fit together without any weird delays. They don't want to have to shift the audio over to line it up later. Right. So they really care about latency. Also, um, anybody that uses virtual instruments, in other words, hey, uh, you hit a key on a synthesizer, you want to hear that sound come back as fast as possible. You don't want any delay. Right. That's where latency is super critical. So you'll hear people talk about Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt's awesome. We get three milliseconds of latency. It's only it's not relevant for us. It right. really doesn't matter. As long as your audio is recorded without clicks and pops, dropouts and things, you're good. And probably aud- and probably automatic is fine. All right. So just stick with automatic or whatever the, whatever the default is, unless otherwise directed by your doctor. Right. And Cole, if it's working for you. Yeah. If it sounds use, good, it is good. It is good. Exactly right. <laughs> Uh, Paul Stefano, the one and only, asks, I have an Apollo twin solo wired through a Belkin Thunderbolt dock. Okay, very specific. Uh, Whenever the monitor goes to sleep and I try to bring it back, the monitor stays black. I have to unplug the Apollo or power cycle it to bring the Mac back up. Sometimes nothing works and I have to reboot. Okay. Uh, That that one happens. I've seen that one happen. But a lot of people have been talking about how, you know, the Apollo is affecting things yeah i haven't heard of that one but i can tell you that anytime you're using any kind of a hub thing Uh, dock don't use a hub docks and hubs are very persnickety like they're really because there there's a lot going on you have a thunderbolt connection going to a a box right and then that box takes that thunderbolt and converts it to everything else right ethernet audio video hd you know all these different things the usb and it's trying to do the best it can and not cause any issues. But sometimes they cause problems, and this is one of those cases. Um, I haven't used a ton of different Thunderbolt docks. The ones I've had the most success with, and still not perfect always, but the most success have been from uh, MacSales.com. That's mm-hmm. Other World, OWC, right. Other World Computing. Right. I think their stuff's pretty dang rock solid. Um, but that's probably what you're dealing with here. You're just dealing with a pesky issue where the dock is getting in the way of things right. so try a different dock perhaps that might be something you might want to try because he doesn't have the right entry on his computer so well yeah if he's using a if he's using a thunderbolt computer that has one thunderbolt port yeah and you have a thunderbolt interface and a monitor that's also needs to be plugged in you right. run out of ports pretty fast right a dock like that becomes important so the routing traffic on there is sort of like the 405 around uh, wilshire boulevard at yeah, about five o'clock it can be i mean All thunderbolt's right. fast but the hub has to be able to keep up right he also has a bone conduction headphones have you guys tried them for live direction seems like a perfect solution to avoid bleed through into the mic on a live session have you played with one of those? Yet? I haven't played. A with while those. ago, I mentioned this. I, I think I have one at home in a drawer somewhere. Right. It's called uh, Aftershocks. Right. A F T E R S H O K C K Z or something. They have a Z on the end. Right. Um, yeah. So instead of going over the ear like regular headphones, they, they go, go like behind neck. the head and they Rubbly they actually through your clavicle. They press and, yeah. like right here on your jaw. Right. Like this and. So they they just they send audio into the jaw, but they also unfortunately radiate sound themselves. Right, they're not totally silent. Right. So if you're playing back something pretty loud, you hear the sound come right out of the right out oh, of the actual that's, transmission. That's going to be like the phone thing we had last week. Yeah. Don't use the phone. It's almost like an open ear open air headphone. They they were designed for people to be able to ride, jog, whatever bike, right, Ski, in traffic outside right. safely and still hear everything around them, which is what they're. De- but unfortunately, I think because of that reason, there's too much bleed. They don't really yeah. work as well as I would have hoped. All right. And Gerard Maguire yes, has a Gerard. question. Yes. If you have a choice of soundproofing a garage or building a booth inside it, what would you recommend and which would be more economical? The garage already is well built and fairly quiet, but it's in L.A. Enough said. Well, that was the first thing that I would ask is, Boy, it can get hot in your garage. Oh, my God. Not the best like place. An oven. Yeah. You know, depending on which direction the door is facing, too. I mean, right, true. Facing south, I mean, you could cook eggs in there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Bake cookies and stuff. That's yeah, true. So he's saying, um, which would be more economical? Um, which one? What is he comparing? Garages? Oh, soundproofing or building? Um, 
Well, building a booth in the garage is way more economical. Yeah. It's way cheaper to build a little three by five box. A closet. Than yeah, it is to soundproof an entire, entire room. 18 by yeah. a 20 foot garage. Way cheaper. So that's a no brainer. Yeah. Building a booth is much cheaper. Then you can, if you build a booth quiet enough, then you can get like a portable air conditioner for right. 300 bucks, pipe it in there with through some baffles. Right. And you can keep that little box cool enough to, to work in all year round. Yeah. You know? I've been seeing those little air conditioners over at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a conduit. You got to run it out a window and stuff. They do. They have, to have, they have to exhaust the heat somewhere. Right. If you're in a garage, the heat's going to exhaust into the, the garage. garage. And then it's going to be 400 degrees right. in there. Right, right. But be able to make is, a roast in there. The thing is, it doesn't work as efficiently because it's taking in hot air and trying to cool that hot air. Right. Versus if it was inside your house... Right. It's circulating the cool air. So your mileage may vary, but sometimes they work okay. All righty. <laughs> well. Good I, luck. Yeah. If you got questions for us that you would like repeated on this show and have us take a shot at the answer, you can email us at theguys at vobs.tv, and we are happy to answer those questions on this very show, just as we demonstrated tonight. Mm-hmm. All That's right. right.